my privilege and my pleasure to welcome you to what is now the fifth of our Followers of the Way gatherings. If you are joining us for the first time today, you're especially welcome. Please bear with us because we're still feeling our way with this, this thing and sometimes it may be a little bit ragged around the edges, but we are not putting on a performance for man. We are offering our hearts to Almighty God. That is the way that we are approaching these things. You will find that the chat has been disabled following a vote last week. Um, the majority of people found it distracting during the service, so we are not having the chat working during the service itself. That's something we'll keep under review. It's not a reflection of the fact that we want to exclude people from participating, quite the reverse, but we are still working out how best to manage these things. Today is Remembrance Sunday, and at 11 o'clock, we will be marking a two minute silence, followed by the playing of the last post. It's a reminder to us as we remember those who have fought to defend our freedoms in years gone by, that God is a God who highly esteems remembrance. Just think of the number of times in scripture when God tells people to remember and not to forget. Think of the way that he gives us symbols to help us remember, whether it be the Passover supper or the, the Lord's supper or whatever it might be. God wants us to remember, not just to remember what human beings have done, but to remember him, his ways, his plans, his purposes, and what he has done in years gone by and continues to do to this present day. So we begin by offering today to God in that context. And we marvel before you, Lord, that the book of Malachi, but at the very end of the Old Testament scriptures, tells us, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in the presence of the Lord concerning those who feared him and honoured his name. Father, we thank you that you are a God of remembrance. And we want to remember you today. Help us please to honour you. We are so very conscious that we cannot worship you properly unless you enable us to do so. And so we're asking you please to come by your spirit amongst us now, to enable us to worship you in spirit and truth, to honour your holy name, to esteem you in the way that we ought, and to bring a smile to your face today. Amen. We begin by offering praise to God so that he may come and inhabit the praises of his people. And I'd like to ask Jane if you would please lead us in song worship. Jane. Thank you. We're going to begin with a hymn that reminds us of God's faithfulness over the years. Lord, for the years, your love has kept and guided us. Lord, for the years, your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us, did us all away. Sought us and saved us, God in them provide. 
generation spirits oppressed by pleasure, wealth, and care. For young and old, for common wealth and nation, Lord of our land, be pleased to hear a prayer. Lord, for our world, when we disown and doubt him, love, blessing, strength, and comfort, blessing, pain, hungry and helpless, lost indeed without him, Lord of the world, we pray that Christ may reign. Lord, for ourselves, in living for you, make us self on the cross and Christ upon the throne. Past put behind us for the future take us, Lord of our lives, to live for Christ alone. The heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon that's fashioned against us shall stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory. Honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And the power of darkness comes in like a flood. The battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. Battle belongs to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Faithful God, so sorry. <laughs> faithful God, faithful God, all sufficient one, we worship you. Shalom, my peace, my strong deliverer. 
I lift you up, faithful God, faithful God, faithful God, oh, Shalom, my peace, my strong deliverer, I lift you up, faithful God, I lift you Great and wonderful God, we welcome you here today. We welcome you into our hearts. We welcome you into this assembly, awed and humbled by your beauty, your majesty, and your holiness. It's an extraordinary thing. I said earlier that God is a God who remembers things with one exception. He chooses not to remember our sins when we faithfully confess them. And so that we may be right with God, as we continue this meeting, we are going to come in compassion before him, trusting and believing that he will be faithful to forgive what we faithfully confess. So, Father, I want to begin with a confession on behalf of our nation, that we have not remembered you. We have not honoured you. We have forgotten and turned away from the evidence of the great things you have done amongst us in years gone by and continue to do today. We reflect with shame upon how you responded to our national days of prayer in the Second World War with miracles and deeds of great might. And yet as soon as danger was passed, we forgot you. Father, we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we have forgotten your commandments. We have forgotten to walk in your ways. We have imagined that we can do things better our own way, and we have gone far astray. We confess these things before you now. We repent of them. We would love to turn away from them, but we have got ourselves into such a mess, we don't even know how to do that any longer. Father, we cast ourselves upon your mercy as a church and as a nation. And Lord, we have sinned on a personal level in ways too numerous to catalogue. Our hearts have become so hard and callous that oftentimes we do not even realise we are sinning anymore. Truly, it is astonishing that you would turn to us and hearken to us, but we know that we, you do. And so, Lord, we place all these things and more before you today to confess them freely in front of you. We don't want to hide anything from you. We are sick and tired of making excuses for things for which there is no excuse. We cast ourselves upon your mercy. And we beg your forgiveness. And Father, we, to our amazement, recollect 
that when we truly repent and confess before you, you remember our sins no more. They are to you as though they had never been. We receive your forgiveness now. We thank you for it. We know that we will go out and do many things wrong again and we will fail again. But we ask you please to take us now weak and foolish though we are and use us to your glory. May your name be greatly praised and may you gain great glory through what happens here today. Amen. I'd like to invite, I don't know whether it's going to be Marie or Robert who's going to read to us from the Bible. Maybe you're doing a, a mix and match, whichever it is of you. Could you please read to us from the scriptures now? You're muted, Robert. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> the technological, okay, here we go. Okay, good. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant. No, <laughs> just read it from, from sorry. We're Our screen technical <laughs> problems, start again. <laughs> I'll do it from here. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and smoked him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and killed him. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the poor of the lion and from the poor of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put on a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword over his armor and he tried in vain to go, for he was not used to them. <clears throat> then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I am not used to them. And David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag or wallet. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistines looked, and saw David, he, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and comely in appearance. And the Philistines said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. 
when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a wonderful scripture. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. Praise God. Very shortly we'll be observing the two minute silence, but I just thought it would be interesting to reflect for a couple of moments before we do that. We're all probably a, a generation where we have family who fought in the great citizen wars of the 20th century, the First World War, the Second World War, and the Korean War. I certainly had family in each of those. And it is uh, right and proper that we should reckon, recollect and mark the sacrifice of those who went before. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, it says, There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. But we are a generation who should keep in remembrance what has been done by those who went before. This is right and proper. But we remember also that the battle is the Lord. And it is won ultimately, not by sword and spear and javelin, but by the power and the dispensation of Almighty God. Many of you will be familiar with the many national days of prayer that were held during the Second World War. They were all attended by extraordinary events afterwards, miraculous events. The two that are perhaps best known are the first and second ones. The first took place in May 1940 as the British Expeditionary Force was trapped at Dunkirk and it looked as though their escape was impossible. The plan to take men off from Dunkirk imagined that they might rescue 10,000 if they were lucky. And in those straitened circumstances, the King, the Prime Minister and the Archbishop of Canterbury called a National Day of Prayer and churches up and down the land were filled to overflowing as people cried out to God for their husbands, brothers and friends who were at Dunkirk. And to this very day you can see photographs of queues of people snaking hundreds of yards from Westminster Abbey as people queued to get into that place to pray. And in the most extraordinary turn of events in the immediate aftermath of that National Day of Prayer, incredible things happened. There was a storm which disrupted the Luftwaffe attacks on the beaches, but the channel itself became glass calm. Many people who were involved at the time remarked upon it. It was like a mill pond. And instead of taking off 10,000 men, the operation that followed took off 350,000. It was an extraordinary thing. And it was recorded at the time as the miracle of Dunkirk. The second National Day of Prayer was during the Battle of Britain which was by no means a foregone conclusion. There were times when it looked as though the Germans were going to win that battle. The RAF at one point was on its knees. And again, the nation was called to prayer. And again, God moved in power in this land. There was a turn in the battle as Goering switched to terror bombing of cities, enabling the RAF to recover and there was on the 15th September what is still marked as Battle of Britain Day, the climactic air battle 
of that phase of the war when 185 German planes were shot down uh, uh, with only a third of many, as many of our own aircraft being lost. It was an extraordinary deliverance and there were many, many more. So much so that when the war ended, Churchill having um, taken a vote of thanks in the House of Commons, then said, let us now go to church to give thanks to Almighty God. For this deliverance, that is the God who has had his hands on this nation and who still does not forget it. And as we recall those things of years past, we recollect also that he has not failed to do these things in the present. As we think about the sacrifice of our men in Iraq and Afghanistan, in the Falklands War, we remember again the extraordinary events of that war when the parachute regiment were attempting to get through to Port Stanley. At the Battle of Goose Green, they found themselves attacking a superior Argentine force dug in on high ground with no cover. That was when the Paras attacked uphill and Colonel H. Jones was shot and killed. And as night fell that night, his second in command didn't know what to do. There was seemingly no way out, according to military doctrine. And he recorded, it's actually on a BBC programme made about the Falklands War. He recorded that he prayed. And as he did so, it suddenly became clear to him what he should do. And the next morning, under cover of a white flag, he and walked up the hill to the Argentine trenches and invited them to surrender. And astoundingly, they did. And as the British troops were collecting the weaponry of the Argentines and um, arranging their prisoners, the Argentine commander said, where are the rest of your men? He couldn't believe that they had surrendered to an inferior force. Again, God took a hand. These things are not from a distant past. They are things that are within living memory. Our God reigns. He is the Lord of battle. The battle is the Lord's and he has not finished with this nation yet. Praise him. So we bring all of those things now in a spirit of remembrance and thanksgiving before God. Thanksgiving for the faithfulness of previous generations. But thanksgiving beyond all else to our great and wonderful God. And we are a couple of minutes away from uh, the 11th minute of the 11th hour. So I, I will just um, say a few more words so that we get ourselves to the 11 o'clock mark, bang on. It is a humbling thing to think of what our forefathers have done. And it is a shameful thing to remember the extent to which we have failed to be the army of God. But Lord, as we come before you now in thanksgiving and recollection, remembrance, we would like to ask please today that you will gather, raise up and empower your army in this nation. The battle is yours, but there are still things that we need to do. And we pray that the people of God in this land will not fail to do what is required of us as you do those things that only you can do. Amen. And so now I would like to invite you please to mark two minutes of silence following which the last post will sound.
let us not be a people who forget. Linda, I'd like to ask you, please, to talk to us. Thank you, Philip. And thank you for that really moving reminder of God's faithfulness to us um, throughout the years and just for the amazing stories of deliverance in uh, the last world war which are, are truly awe-inspiring if you if you do do read them and our God's been such a, a great and fantastic and faithful God hasn't he and he's still that same that same God which is wonderful let's just uh, commit this now to the Lord Lord we just Pray that your spirit will overshadow us and that you will speak to our hearts and minds. And Lord, just re-envision us for this battle that is still raging today. Lord, we just ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Wow. The 11th minute of the 11th hour on the 11th of November, 1918. That was the, uh, the time, the date when the armistice was signed that was bringing to an end the hostilities between the Allies and Germany. And it was signed at Le Franco near Compiègne in France. Now, the precise figures uh, are unknown, but there are estimated between 1914 and 1918 to have been 40 million casualties, and half of that number are believed to have died. For the most part, these were young men, many below the age of 30 and many in their teens. And we owe a huge debt of gratitude to those who endured the conflict and paid that ultimate price to preserve the freedom of those back home and to defend our land. And again, that similar sacrifice in the Second World War. But we must equally give thanks for those who are still battling to defend our freedoms today. And of course we do, as Philip's already uh, mentioned, we remember all those who've lost their lives in more recent conflicts and who've suffered um, terrible, life-changing injuries, some of them. Remember those soldiers in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in the Falklands. And we do thank and honour them for their willingness to give their lives for our freedom. And perhaps some of you will have your own personal memories uh, today of people who've paid that price. But apart from armed conflict, there are other battles that we do need to hold in mind. And especially the deadly battle that's currently being waged in society today to destroy the values on which our culture is founded. Values of faithfulness, commitment, purity, goodness, duty, selflessness, self-sacrifice, self-control all expressive of our Christian heritage and our faith. And what we're seeing in the world today is a naked and avert conflict of ideologies, with forces that are hostile to God seeking to take control and to silence all opposition. Now, this is an age old battle, of course, between good and evil between God and the devil. But it is a fact that over the last century, evil has grown very, very strong because of the worship mankind has given it right across the globe. We sacrifice our unborn, we celebrate and encourage promiscuity and perversion. But worst of all, increasingly, mankind has rejected God. Because we're in control, we say. We don't need all that superstitious nonsense anymore. We don't need that fairy in the sky as secularists sometimes so disparagingly refer to God. This kind of approach with all that it entails is so endemic and so frightening that actually it's tempting just to, to give up and go with the flow. 
keep our heads down and stay out of the firing line, in fact, in case we become a target, in case we become injured. Well, I imagine that that's how the Israelites felt when they were attacked by the Philistines and the giant Goliath challenged them to send out a champion to fight him and settle the outcome of the war by single combat. Verse four, we read that Goliath was nine feet tall with bronze armor and bronze weapons and his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod with an iron point weighing 600 shekels. Now the note in my Bible says that that would have been about 15 pounds. I don't know much about weapons, but um, <laughs> that sounds pretty scary to me if someone comes out to fight you with holding that sort of thing. And perhaps not surprisingly, the Israelites at this point said, whoa, not me. <laughs> in the whole army, we read that there wasn't one man willing to put himself forward to answer the challenge. So there would have been a real danger here. The Israelites were going to end up conquered by the Philistines and enslaved completely under their subjection. No one wanted to resist him. Goliath repeated his challenge every day and no one came forward until that moment when David came along. And now David, son of Jesse, was, we read, still pretty much of a child. He was too young to go with his brothers to war. Instead, he had stayed at home, looking after the sheep with his father. But that fateful day, Jesse had sent him with bread and grain as a gift to his brothers and to see how they were getting on at the front. And I guess actually human nature being what it is and boys being what they are, I guess it would have been quite a thrilling outing for David. Off to see his brothers, off to see the great Israelite army, off to see Saul. Let's face it, these guys, they were pretty good. No one can stand against the Israelites. But when David got to Ella, where the two sides were lined up facing each other, he found this extraordinary situation. Goliath came out and roared his usual daily challenge. And to David's amazement, all these brave fighting men of Israel that he probably pretty much idolized, certainly admired, what did they do? They ran away. You couldn't see them for dust. Although when you read the account, let's be fair, they did find time to tell David that if anyone was stupid enough to accept the challenge and lucky enough to win, that Saul would give that man great wealth and even marry him to his daughter. Verse 25. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his, fa sorry, will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. Now, that's actually not a bad inducement, I'd have thought, when you think about it. But it clearly wasn't enough for the, uh, the Israelite troops. Now, you might think at this point that David was a bit of an idiot. He was very young, certainly. But this um, appears to seem pretty much a no-brainer to David. Who is this uncircumcised man that he should defy the armies of the living God, he asked. It's verse 26. And the response to this seems to have been pretty much ridicule. And then his brothers came up, and not just was there ridicule, but there was real anger. Because, um, let's face it, they probably wouldn't want attention being drawn to them. And they, they accused David of being a bit dim and conceited. And then Saul got to hear of it, the king. And you know what? David still wouldn't shut up. <laughs> Have you ever been in that situation? 
where you just wish that somebody would take their foot out of their mouths and they would just give up before it all got worse. David didn't. He kept on digging the hole. And he said to Saul, king of Israel, hmm, your servant will go and fight him. However you look at this, I think that would have appeared utterly ludicrous. David was a young boy, probably, I don't know, mid-teens? No idea. But he was too small to wear the armour that Saul lent him. We read, we've just heard that um, he couldn't walk in it. He couldn't handle Saul's sword, probably tripped up. So what did he do? Did he at this point begin to think better of this? Did he go home, tail between his legs? Not a bit of it. David took off all the armor, laid down the sword and said, you know what? I think I'll, um, I'll go like I am. I won't bother with the armor, I won't use your weapons. Instead, I'll just stick with the sling that I've been using out in the desert to fight off the lions and the bears while I was looking after the sheep. I'm pretty good with that. I wonder, was David just being arrogant? I bet his brothers thought that. I'll bet they were hugely embarrassed. But David wasn't being arrogant. Not at all. The key thing about David was that he had real faith. He knew that the God of Israel was sovereign and that there was no way he was going to allow some jumped up Philistine to insult him and conquer his people. David would have known all the stories of what Yahweh had done in Egypt of the deliverance of his people. But the difference between him and the rest of the army was that David must have believed these stories. But there's something else that we need to realize here. The really important thing is that God had been training David out in the desert since he was knee high for precisely this task, this moment. As David looked after the flocks from the sand pit, they'd been pretty frequently attacked by wild beasts. David, he mentions, doesn't he, lions and bears. Pretty frightening. And the boy had learnt to use his sling with deadly effect. And that's something that we all need to know now. When God calls someone to a specific task, First of all, he prepares them. God will never send you in cold, but he first gives you the training that you're going to need. And sometimes that training can be pretty rough because it has to prepare you to stand against attack, to be absolutely unshakable whatever's thrown at you, whatever comes against you, so that you won't falter or back down, so that you can stand. And God doesn't just provide the weapons that you're going to need. He doesn't just lay them out in front of you and say, that might be a good idea or that one. God teaches you how to use those weapons. I wonder if some of you feel that you've been through a rough time over these last years. I wonder if you feel that all sorts of things have been thrown against you. Everything's gone wrong. Well, if you have, friends rejoice because God has been training you for precisely this time that we're in now so that you might be able to stand. Thank God for that training. So here, back to this story. David, I have no doubt, knew that he could not fight Goliath in his own strength and that he was going to have to rely on God 
and to use the weapons that God had trained him for. And in David's case, this was a sling. Sounds pretty feeble, doesn't it? But this is a lesson for us here to be bold, not to try and rely on our own strength because we will fail, but instead to rely on God and just follow his commands in absolute obedience. And here in this story, right on cue, God comes up with the goods, just as David had known that he would. Verse 40, we read that David chose five small stones from the stream and he put them in the pouch slung around his waist and he took the sling in his hand. Hmm. Now looked at objectively, this is complete and utter insanity. I mean, let's face it, five small pebbles against this this giant, this, this armored, this weaponized man who's been trained to kill from youth. I guess God was having a laugh, wasn't he? But David had been trained by God. And these five small pebbles were exactly right. In answer to Goliath, David said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And he said, you know what? I'm going to win. And he could say that because Goliath had challenged God. And so David knew that God was going to take him down so that the whole world would know that there was a God in Israel and that he was sovereign, not because of how good the Israelites were and how, hey, you know, they really needed to be saved. God was going to do this so that all the world would know that he was God and there was no other beside him. The battle is the Lord's. And this is something that we have to fully understand and know about the fight that we are in today. Friends, evil has got very cocky and is challenging God on all sides. We see it. It seems to be going increasingly powerful. But don't believe it. God is in control. And he will not let evil win. God knows exactly what he's going to do. And the outcome is already decided. God has even described the final conflict in scripture. And he's told us that Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And at that point, all of humanity will come under judgment. Those who have loved him and those who have rejected him. And what we're seeing now is actually a process of refinement. It's a last chance for people to turn to God and to be saved from that judgment that lies ahead. And that's why we are seeing so many battlegrounds all around us and why the fighting feels to be so vicious at the moment. But you know what? God has trained us for this time. Each one of you, God has trained you. And he gives us the weapons that will allow us in his name to fight the battles and win. We're only called, like David, to stand. And God does the rest. So today, as we remember those who, for our sake, given their lives in war. Let's commit ourselves to honour them by keeping faith in the battle that God is calling us to now. By God's mercy at the moment, in this country at least, although it's not the same throughout the world, but in this country, it's not a battle being fought with guns and missiles. 
but it is deadly. And if we don't engage in this fight, if we run away, if we keep our heads down, if we say anything for a quiet life, well, no one else is going to stand. So the message for all of us today is trust in the Lord and go in his name. And together, let's stand against this evil. That the Lord's name may be glorified. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Linda reminded us in that talk that David believed the stories he heard about what God had done in Israel's past. And she talked about our taking a stand. So we are now going to take a stand and to um, state our belief in who God is and what he has done in the past by making our own declaration of faith. As uh, Chantal just calls up onto the screen, the Apostles' Creed that we're going to read through together. It's, it's so encouraging for us, of course, when we are able to mark the things that God is doing in our own lives, and the, no matter how big or small they might be. And so just to encourage you, I want to tell you about something that's happened recently with one of our number, Neil, Neil Weldon, was having problems getting a driving license approved for a HGV license approved from the rather dilatory DVLA. There was prayer about that last week. And what do you know? Instant resolution of that issue. Praise God. That might be a, a small thing in the, in the eyes of the world, but it's a big thing to an individual. And because it's big to an individual, therefore it's big to God too. So this is the God whom we worship and adore, a prayer answering God. And we are going now to say together what we believe about this God, who he is and what he does. I'd like to invite you please to stay muted simply because it's too much a, a cacophony if we all try and speak together out loud. But maybe in the privacy of your own home, you might also want to speak this aloud as I need it for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, that is to say, universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And because we believe these things, because they are true, because this is who God is. We know that he hears prayer and he answers prayer. And therefore, I'd like now to invite Sue and Andrew to lead us in our corporate prayer. Over to you, Sue. Yeah. Dear Lord, today we're remembering all the fallen the armed forces who were wounded in war and conflict in all world wars. The nation got behind them in their fight for freedom. I have no, have no ideas, Lord Jesus, how the soldiers, the sailors, the naval and the merchants and the airmen found the courage within them to fight for the freedom that has been so threatened over the many battles and conflicts. 
the attacks of evil regimes and ideologies, the forces of evil trying to force themselves and dictate and reign over your good. I want to thank you, Lord, because of these brave people. I haven't had to find that courage. I haven't had to leave my family and friends to go to another planet, another, the other side of the planet to fight, to serve, to risk my life. There have been many wars and conflicts in my time, the Falklands, the Middle East on many fronts, the war on terror, which still rages on. Mm -hmm. But to most of my generation, we watch this unfold on television, Lord, on news reports, not experience it, but looking on and taking the reality out of it. Because of these people, because of their courage, my wife and children were kept safe. I remember, Lord, people like my father, who served just after the Second World War, fighting in conflicts in Burma and in India. And it wasn't until recently, before he passed on to be with you, he was able to speak about it and some of the horrors he experienced and the comrades he'd lost. I never knew for, until late that he was one of the last soldiers to leave India when it gained its independence. He was under fire as they left. And I never knew the toll it took on him. And I remember him now, Lord. How could it? It wasn't my experience. There is so much bravery, Lord Jesus, in the ordinary people that surfaces when evil raises its ugly head mm -hmm. to suppress and to oppress people. Almighty Father, the fight, the fight for freedom goes on. The courage and love you, you from you is still manifesting itself today in so many ways. I remember a documentary on the three Burma Rangers. It tells a story of a man called by God to enter conflict areas, a former missionary child who trained in the American military. He went to Burma to train and equip people with the same love for their fellow man in Burma. And he also went to Iraq. He was rescuing the displaced, tending the injured, offering all love Jesus Christ freely to friend and enemy alike. He took his wife and his children, and they are living examples of your power and of your love that share in your word by deed and example, following your commandments to love you and your neighbour. And I'll just read a soldier's prayer. Brave warriors, should fight, fight find us in battle, may our cause be joined. <clears throat> may our leaders have clear vision. May our courage not falter. May we be triumphant and earn victory as we show mercy to our enemies. May our efforts bring lasting peace. May our sacrifice be all, always be appreciated by those we serve. May we return to our loved ones unharmed. Should we be harmed, may our wounds heal. Should we perish in the struggle, may God embrace us and find for us a place in his kingdom. Amen. Lord, well, you reminded me during the week of the famous poem written by John McRae um, in 1915. I'm just going to read that now and building on everything that has been said earlier today from Linda, from Philip, and to remember all those that have given their lives and still give their lives today. I'm just going to read this and build on that, Lord. For your vision for us, for our future, for our fights, for our individual fights. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow, between the crosses row and row. That mark our place and in the sky, the lark still bravely singing fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago. We lived, felt down, saw sunset glow, loved. And we loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch for yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though puppies grow. Father, I, I just pray for that torch. I feel, Lord, in, in the past number of years that that glimmer has gone down. It's been a fading torch. It's shone very, very dimly. 
But Father, I pray that as we take the stand for this current fight, for this current fight for freedom, for the current fight for our children, our teens, our adults, the oppressed, the suffering, the alone. Father, I pray that each and every one of us take those gifts and talents, those things that you've given us and trained us in, like those five small stones, like the experience of David, that we take those as our torches and we lift our torches up and that you would set those torches ablaze once again, Lord, just as they did on that call in, the, in Dunkirk when they went to the churches where they got on their knees and their battle was turned because we faced the foe and their torches shone. Let us raise our torch today like that cry from Flanders Fields that there'd be like beacons around the coast of our lands, wherever we are, what are we doing? Let us hold them high, let us speak up, let us be brave, let us be courageous, and let us continue this fight for our voice and our freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so very much. Sarah and Andrew, how, <coughs> how very appropriate. Uh, soldiers' prayer in Flanders Field poem. Oh, those are words for the day. Sometimes there are, there are moments when you, your heart's so full you can't respond with words. You can respond with something else. Uh, and uh, I think it's that moment of response now in song. So, Jane, could you please lead us in song for us to respond to everything that we've heard and experienced? Mm -hmm. Great is the darkness that covers the earth, oppression, injustice, and pain. Nations are slipping in hopeless despair. No man has called me your name. Watching while sanity dies, touched by the madness and lies. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit, we pray. Come. Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on us today. May now your church rise with power and love, this glorious gospel proclaim. In every nation, salvation will come to those who believe in your name. Help us bring light to this world, that we might speed your return. Come. Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, for our just spirit we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, for our just spirit on us today. Great celebrations on that final day when out of the heavens you come darkness will vanish all sorrow will end and rulers will bow at your throne a great commission Then face to face we shall meet. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, for our just spirit we pray. 
Jesus, all your Jesus, all of your spirit on us today. Brilliant. Thank you, Jane. Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit, we pray. There is nothing more that needs to be said because the battle is the Lord and the victory is the Lord. Praise the Holy 